Hello and welcome to the Nevada Independence on the record interview with Amy Villela, who is challenging incumbent Congresswoman Dina Titus in the District 1 Democratic primary. I'm Assistant Editor Jackie Valley, and I'm joined today by reporters Janelle Calderon and Sean Galanka. We wanted to start by asking you why you think you deserve to be elected over Dina Titus. You know, my opponent has held um, the seat for District 1 since it was first redrawn um, to be the Democratic stronghold in, in this state. And, you know, she had the opportunity during that time, um, as she's had, you know, to actually fight for bold, progressive policies that would make a real change in the working class lives. Um, and she's not had an you know, opponent uh, from either the, the Democrat or Republican side um, to have to uh, really defend that seat to. This was a, a real opportunity to be a lead in progressive, in a progressive voice and to be a true fighter for change that's necessary. But, you know, she declined to do so and in, has instead used, embraced that security as an excuse to kind of take her foot off the pedal and uh, not work to make sure that she is engaging her base and, and motivating them to get out to the polls and vote. I mean, cycle after cycle, whether it's presidential or midterm, uh, she's consistently delivered 20,000 fewer votes than her counterparts up in CD2. And, you know, this has an effect not only for this district, but for um, the state as well. I mean, for our other positions in the state, such as the governorship or state senators. Um, and when it comes down to, you know, fighting for the issues that are really on the forefront of, especially when it comes to the climate change, um, she has, again, um, let down the constituency by putting, uh, you know, by introducing a bill called uh, SNEDCA, which is the Clark County Lands Bill, into Congress. Um, right now, Las Vegas is the fastest warming, fastest growing uh, city in the country, and we are literally running out of water and running out of time. And instead of uh, fighting for uh, legislation that would actually, you know, address our climate crisis, um, she's pushing through that disastrous bill into Congress, which would increase the size of Las Vegas by the size of St. Louis. And it would, uh, you know, increase emissions from gas, from vehicles traveling from out in the outskirts into the valley, um, which would, you know, have a disproportionate effect on our communities that are most vulnerable. So, you know, on the issues and on the fight that it takes to actually get legislation passed um, for the working class, um, I don't feel that she has um, adequately performed. And what we need are people in Congress who understand the struggle and we'll take that lived experience with them into the halls of Congress and fight for us. You know, I know that struggle firsthand. I have that lived experience. I'm ready to fight and I'm ready to be a champion for the working class. Well, we'll dive into many of those issues much deeper throughout the course of this interview. But, but you know, you mentioned climate policy. You mentioned, uh, you know, she hasn't taken enough progressive action. What would you do differently if elected? Well, I definitely support a Green New Deal. I mean, like I said, we are we are feeling the brunt of climate change here in Las Vegas. I mean, I just saw a report this morning that homes, some homes in Henderson may have an eruption of water because our water levels are becoming so low. This is not the time to be pushing, pu pushing through land bills that are give a, a, a giveaway to greedy developers. I mean, it'd be the largest, you know, uh, transfer of public lands into private hands. Uh, right now, we need to be working for a Green New Deal. And with the Green New Deal, it would not only bring good paying union jobs to this for, to this state, but it would also address our housing crisis that we're facing. Um, in the Green New Deal, we're talking about building, you know, uh, affordable housing units um, and making sure that they're sustainable. So right now we don't need to be building out and, and doing endless sprawl into our desert. We need to be building up, not out. Um, it would also, you know, address uh, bringing in possibly more industries into this state where we could, people could have a choice of whether they want to work in a casino or not, right? And we know that, you know, Nevadans are feeling the effects of climate change in their pocketbooks. We, in the desert here, we feel when the temperatures are rising, it affects us directly financially. Um, part of the Green New Deal is retrofitting existing structures to make sure that they are, you know, uh, they are, uh, Great green and that we're not wasting energy. So there's a lot of things that that uh, a Green New Deal will address and that is definitely something I support which my opponent does not. You know, digging past some of just introduced legislation, I want to get into her record a little bit. Uh, you know, can you name any votes, three votes that you would disagree with Dina Titus on? 
I think more importantly, it's, it's to talk about, you know, how I would legislate. So most recently, which would be something that would be in people's minds, is when we were in the fight for the Build Back Better bill. Um, you know, there was um, a lot of discussion around the Build Back Better bill. And it was something that would have a lot of good uh, portions that would really, you know, help working families. Um, and along with that was the infrastructure bill. Now, the more conservative Democrats and people that were more interested in, in, interested in corporate interest really wanted some of the key elements in the infrastructure bill. It was largely a giveaway to corporations. We had an opportunity at that point to withhold our vote on the infrastructure bill to hold out for the Build Back Better bill, which a handful of progressives did. We may not have gotten everything we wanted out of the Build Back Better bill, but we would have gotten something. And instead, they caved. And they actually went and voted for the infrastructure bill first. And all that time, they kept on saying, we're not voting for that until we, get, we vote on the Build Back Better. That's the type of leadership that we need. It, I think it's more important to talk about because what we're going to have in the House and the Senate is we have a fight between sides right now, right? There's a lot of arguing, a lot of standstill. We need to be better at drawing our own lines in the sand. Republicans are very good at this. They go in, they say, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, I'm, I want this, and everyone caves to them. It's time that, as Democrats, we stand up for the working class who we're supposed to be representing and start drawing our own lines in the sand. So you would have voted against the infrastructure bill to, to try to force a, a vote on the Build Back Better? Absolutely. Okay. And you mentioned a little bit about uh, the partisanship that is right now in Congress. And we've also seen that bipartisanship is very important. If you were elected, how would you work to build those bridges with Republicans and more moderate uh, Democrats to pass legislation? Well, I think a lot of the issues that I'm running on, they cross party lines. I mean, the issues I'm running on are actually popular across party lines with the majority of Americans. The majority of Americans, they support a universal health care system. The majority of Americans want the representative to vote for a Green New Deal. Uh, they want us to, to trans, you know, transfer off of um, fossil fuels onto you know, uh, investing into green new uh, technology. These are things that are wanted by the people, and these are things that you know, we can work across the aisle. We can also, there's a lot of um, uh, individuals and representatives in both sides that I can definitely work with that, you know, oppose us being in endless foreign conflicts. Um, I am adamantly opposed to remaining in, in, corn, in foreign conflicts, especially when there's so much needs to be done here at home for our working class. So there's, uh, you know, I am definitely um, able to work across the aisle. I'm able to work with people. Um, and where I can work across, across the aisle, I definitely will. But I also think the power comes from the people. And we're not just talking to Democrats, we're talking to Republicans and to everyone. Because, you know, when it comes down to the issues that we're all facing, it's not an us versus them. It's the have and the have nots. It is a class issue. And we are seeing the middle class is, is, is right now disappearing. And we are having a, the in inequity between, you know, the ultra wealthy and the poor is just growing. And we need to be addressing those issues and talking about it in real tangible ways. Um, and, and I feel that's where you gain most of your strength. Speaking of strength, if elected, actually, Nevada would lose some seniority in the House. Mm -hmm. How do you think that would affect representation for the state? I'd like to ask, what is the, what is the good of seniority if you don't use it? So, you know, we have and we have seen the power of progressives in Congress right now. When we're talking about issues that are facing all of us and major issues, it's the progressives who get the most airtime. They're actually talking about, you know, the actual um, solutions to the problems we're facing. And when it comes to action, they are the ones that are pressing our president to actually pass some of the legislation that's popular amongst, uh, you know, working class. Um, and I'll take one example. Um, so, you know, um, Representative Cory Bush, who's new. Um, when the housing moratorium was about, to, the eviction moratorium was about to expire, you know, um, unfortunately, my opponent went home on vacation, but it was the progressives that were sitting on the steps of the Capitol. And it was the senior representatives that were coming to them on the steps of the Capitol. And they were able to get that extended because they sat there. They were fighting for the people. They know what it's like to be homeless. They know what it's like to struggle. And it's that lived experience that's missing from so many of our representatives. You do have power. Um, and it's just a matter of using every tool at your disposal and working around the clock 
to organize and to actually push legislation and push the narrative so that we can get true change. You mentioned this a little bit earlier with the infrastructure bill, but is there anything else you can point to that you might disagree with um, with Democrats in power right now in Congress? Um, I definitely feel that we need to be avoiding, avoiding um, you know, uh, foreign conflict. I am against being an endless conflict. I'm, in, I'm against um, constantly, uh, you know, monetarily funding the military industrial complex. And I say this as an active duty military spouse. And I would be the first ever, if elected, to be serving as an active duty military spouse with my spouse currently serving in the military. Um, uh, we need to put emphasis on um, what's happening here on, on our own home front. We have a lot of problems and our working class is struggling. They are hurting. They are losing their, their, you know, their wealth. They are losing their health. Um, they need to be bailed out. They need to be bailed out. Um, I also disagree with taking corporate PAC money. I disagree with taking money from union busters like Amazon, like my opponent is. Um, we need to be t taking money from individuals for our, for our runs for office and not corporations. Because when it comes down to it, we cannot continue to serve the interest of corporations over the interest of people. And just to clarify, you have not accepted corporate PAC money at all? That's correct. I will not accept a cent. Okay, and you mentioned a little bit, but to get a little ahead, would you support uh, the administration's efforts to provide billions in aid to Ukraine? I definitely believe in humanitarian aid, as everyone else is horrified by the images that we're seeing on TV. Um, you know, I am also equally horrified. I do not agree with what um, uh, the steps that Putin has taken. But at the same time, we have to be very careful and that we don't uh, see, uh, see us be pushed into another world war. And, you know, I am horrified at the deaths that are happening, but we also have to be very cognitive of the steps that we're taking because one person getting hurt from NATO could throw us in the thrust of war. And let's talk about what that looks like. This is not, you know, a country that is um, not centralized and is run by um, different elders and groups like Afghanistan. This is a, a country that has nuclear weapons. And the amount of harm and damage and the death toll both abroad and here would be catastrophic. So when we're talking about, you know, providing aid, yes, we need to provide aid for humanitarian efforts. But we, we need to also be pushing for every diplomatic resolution we can. And if Ukraine wants to, to go into negotiations with Russia, we should not be saying we don't agree. We should be pushing for every, every measure of diplomacy. And, and that's what democracy looks like, right? It's not us stepping in and, and dictating the terms of resolution or uh, instigating, you know, coups or whatever else the case may be. We need to be diplomats of diplomacy and making sure that we are going for peace. You mentioned humanitarian aid, but avoiding uh, foreign interference. You know, Congress right now, considering a multi-billion dollar you know, weapons package to Ukraine, uh, that would include money for weapons, sending weapons from the U.S. to Ukraine. Uh, is that something that you would oppose? Would you rather see those dollars sent elsewhere? You know, I find it very interesting that every time that we bring up, we bring up uh, policies like universal health care, or tuition-free colleges and universities, or um, paying back student loans for individuals, it's always, we, where's, we don't have the money. We don't have the money. We can't do that. Well, I, I'm here to say that we have... We, we, it's a matter of priority. It's a matter of willpower. It's a matter of political courage. What we need to be doing is investing in our working class here, our economy. We have tens of thousands of Americans dying every year from a lack of health care. The estimates go between 40 to 60,000 Americans a year. I, I want you to think about that. That's 40 to 60,000 Americans a year are dying from a lack of health care. That to me, is also a humanitarian crisis, and it's right here on our, on, our, on our doorsteps. And, you know, from someone who's lost a child because of our profit-driven healthcare system, one death is one too many. That's needless. And it's, it's an enormous number when it's someone you love. So, I mean, getting back to that question, would you support using dollars for, for military aid for Ukraine, for sending weapons to Ukraine? 
you know, I'm not in Congress at the moment, and um, I would have to know the scope and what they're going to be doing. But again, the more that we send over, the more that we're messaging. Um, I find it very scary. There's members of Congress saying that we're already at war. The more that we're messaging that we are actively participating in this, the closer we are to crossing that line. And um, I would be very hesitant to approve additional funds for military weapons. Um, we don't need to be funding the military industrial complex. We need to be pushing and advocating for peace and taking every step possible towards that. I uh, want to shift gears back a little bit to, you know, kind of the rift we're seeing in the, in the Democratic Party today. Um, in 2021, uh, someone you supported, Nina Turner, lost a high profile race, uh, New York mayoral race that was a, a loss for progressives. Um, you know, how do you think in, in this year your progressive brand connects with voters in District 1? I don't know that it's a progressive brand. I mean, I'm running on the issues. The issues are what's important to me. Um, I think that the issues I'm running on are really speaking to the constituents in this district. Um, this district is hit hardest by some of the issues that we're facing, housing, uh, good jobs, immigration. We can go down the list. The things I'm running on would bring a true substantial change to the constituents in this district. I'm not particularly concerned with labels or with uh, you know, uh, any kind of those uh, uh, identities. I am more concerned with the suffering that I am hearing as I'm on the ground talking to people. I'm more concerned with the deaths that are continuing to, to happen in this country. I'm more concerned when I hear that people can't afford a home and there's nothing available and, or they don't have enough money to put food on the table. Those are the things that, that, that drive me and why I'm running. My why is, is, is my love for people an understanding of the cost for ineffectual leadership for the working class. You know, with that in mind, that even even putting aside labels, there are still divisions within the Democratic Party, divisions between, you know, people who would align with more progressive side of the party and a more moderate side of the party. How do you bridge those divisions? Again, I go back to the issues I'm running on. I mean, if, if we look at the issues I'm running on, all of them are overwhelmingly supported by Democrats. Um, again, it just comes down to, you know, um, to me, it comes down to what type of leadership do we want in this seat and what kind of fighter do we deserve in this congressional district? Um, and that's what this comes down to. I mean, across the board, I mean, I, I have never heard a Democrat tell me yet that they don't believe that health care is a human right. I have never heard them say that there is not a, a, a climate crisis that's happening. I'm sure there might be some Democrats that feel that way, but I personally have never run across them in, in this district or in this state. Um, so the issues I'm running on, again, I mean, those are unifying. Uh, the fact that we all want, we don't want, none of us want to see anyone dying from a lack of health care. None of us want to see this, this earth get to a point that it's uninhabitable. I mean, you guys are much younger than me. <laughs> and I'm sure that that's like a concern for you, for your future. Am I going to have an inhabitable planet? Uh, we want to be able to provide for our families. We want to be able to have a home to live in and to be able to, to thrive, not just exist, but thrive. Um, these are all like things that, you know, uh, any Democrat I've ever heard wants to see happen and come to fruition. Um, so I, I'm, like I said, I'm more concerned with making sure that we stay on topic about the issues and that as a party that we get back into this. It's not left versus right, uh, progressive versus, you know, uh, more centrist. It's more about how do we create true change and, and solve the issues that are facing our working class. So what grade would you give Joe Biden after a year um, and a half? Uh, well, definitely, uh, I don't know that he could even get a grade yet. It'd probably be incomplete. Mm -hmm. I mean, there hasn't been, the promises that he's made have not been, they have not, they've not come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very concerning for the Democratic Party as a whole. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should ask it this way. Do you think he should run for re-election in 2024? Oh, wow, I've never been asked that. <laughs> um, you know, I feel that if, if he doesn't start making some changes and really start delivering on those key promises that he made, um, I feel that, we are, that, that our presidency is in jeopardy. And I think he needs to take swift action now. He needs to, to, to make good on, on, his, on his promises and, and make sure that he is actually addressing the needs of you know, again, the constituency and the working class, they're the ones that hold the vote. 
And, and that's not just true for Joe Biden. That's true for any Democrat that is running right now. The seats are, they are really at risk if we don't start delivering on promises. And on the flip side of that question, if not Joe Biden, are there other progressives you would support for the presidency? I haven't heard of any that have come forward and, and said that they are having an interest in running. Um, and until I see that, I wouldn't know until I would see who, who that would be. Um, it's not to me, again, I'm not big on the, the labels. I want to know what are you running for? What are, how are you going to fight for the American people? You know, how are you going to address the, the, the ills that, that are ailing all of us? Um, that to me is the most important thing. Let's move on to another big topic, immigration. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think should be done for DACA recipients and others who are living undocumented in our communities? We absolutely need to uh, have a pathway towards citizenship for the 11 million undocumented community members. I mean, time after time, Democrats, both here in Nevada and across the country, keep on running on a platform of immigration reform. And then after the election, nothing happens. It's time to stop using our immigrant communities as political footballs, and it's time for them to stop living in fear. And this is personal to me. I mean, my husband's an immigrant from Brazil, a major in the Air Force, and our family right now is navigating this system as undocumented, uh, they're undocumented right now in the United States. And this system is cruel, it's complex, and it's very, very expensive to navigate. We also need to stop you know, uh, the mass deportations and separating families at the border, and we need to permanently reverse Title 42. I mean, this is, this is the pathway forward. Um, again, these are people's lives, people that, that have been here. They are you know, uh, participants in our community, and they deserve you know, a pathway towards citizenship. And it's because of the roadblocks we've put in ourselves that we're having all these issues. Um, we need to, once and for all, you know, go in and make sure that we are doing a, a humane overhaul of our immigration system. Many economists say that the government spending in the federal COVID relief bills helped stabilize the economy, but may also have contributed to inflation. Do you think that trade-off was worth it? I think that's a false statement. Because if you look at the actual reporting on the amount of uh, income and profit major sectors received over the last two years, they're actually should be charged with profiteering. So when we talk about the oil industry, when we talk about the, the healthcare industry, when we talk about grocers, when we're talking about other, other forms like Walmart and Amazon, they all made record profits while we were going through COVID and while the average working Americans suffered. This is really a need for us to address corporate profiteering and greed at a federal level. Um, you know, and when we talk about the relief that was given, the relief that was promised was not given in full. And then when they did do plans, because they don't have the experience, I mean, as I mentioned, I was, I was a CFO by trade. Um, there's not very many of them in Congress, if any. <laughs> um, they don't understand how businesses work. And here in Las Vegas, we have a, cu we have a huge entrepreneurial uh, you know, you know side to our businesses, right? We have a lot of small business owners, but they don't get paid. They don't pay themselves through payroll. They pay themselves as independent contractors or take draws. When we talk about the PPP loan, it was gobbled up first because there was no protections put in place to make sure that it went to evenly out and was distributed by huge corporations that had the means and the abilities to navigate the very, you know, difficult and, and hard paperwork for them to fill out. Um, but then it also left out our entrepreneurs because they wouldn't qualify, because they, didn't, they weren't on payroll, and they were, they were you know, LLCs or sole proprietors. So there's a huge sector of people that really needed that help, while again, large corporations gobbled up the majority of the aid. Um, we need people in office to understand how that works. Well, let's go back to the COVID relief bills for a second. Um, there was another report that came out recently suggesting that 100 million people could catch COVID this upcoming fall and winter. Do you think we're moving on too quickly from the pandemic? And do we perhaps need another COVID relief bill? You know, I really leave that up to the scientists. Um, I have heard from them that, yes, we are heading to another, another possible spike. Um, I do think that it would be in our best interest to start preparing, especially, I mean, you can't tell people to stay home and make them stay home and then give them no financial aid. It's inhuman. It's inhumane. And then we, we, we're sitting here and, and talking about the possibility of going to nothing. Then we need to start preparing and talking about real solutions. 
Um, and so then that means monetary aid. Again, we can bail out big corporations, but for somehow whenever it comes out to bailing out the American people, we all of a sudden have no money. Uh, we need to make sure that that money's there and that we are ready if that is in case what's, what's gonna happen in the future. Whether it's some type of COVID relief bill or some kind of economic stimulus bill, um, monetary help for regular citizens, what do you think that should look like? We definitely need to give them um, you know, income. We need to give them more checks. If we're gonna tell them that they have to stay home, they need to be able to provide for their families. Um, we should create bills that actually also help small businesses and help keep them afloat and keep them going as a going concern as we navigate through this. I mean, we, so many people lost their businesses. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in this district even that lost their small businesses. And it's not just the casinos. I keep hearing that Las Vegas is back because casinos are back up. But the fact <clears> of the <throat> matter is they're not back up to the 100% of their workforce that they were before COVID hit. Back up, who, ha, with, with, what is the economy back up for who? It's for the casinos. But there's more people in this industry than just the casinos. The casinos also hire and use a lot of small businesses. The coffee makers that are there in some of these places, I mean, there's, there's the whole list, right? A lot of them lost their businesses. A lot of those people are still unemployed. We have to have solutions that really support those individuals, the people most at risk in our communities, and not just the large corporations. You say income for those people at home. Uh, you know, does that a, a universal basic income, improved unemployment uh, insurance, or, or a higher minimum wage? What does that look like? Well, I mean, if we're talking about COVID, we definitely need to have some kind of basic income. If they're going to make people stay at home again, and and, uh, and if that's what it calls for, then, I mean, you know, I'm, again, I go by the science. Um, we have to make sure people have a way to live. We have to make sure they're able to pay for food. They're able to, you know, keep their homes. Um, you know, and when it talks, I mean, higher wages, whether we have COVID or not, I mean, wages have been stagnant for decades as CEOs and CFOs and the rest of the executive boards, their wages have increased by immense amounts. We have to have livable wage. I mean, we're, we're not even to the point of being $15 an hour. You can't even get a, a one bedroom home in Las Vegas apartment. You can't even sustain that on $15 well, an hour. Well, on that note, what do you think is a fair minimum wage federally? Well, if it had been tied to inflation as it should have been, we should be at around $22 an hour right now. And we need to tack, we need to tack, you know, the minimum wage to inflation. I mean, you know, we've been at 50 for how long, you know, and then we finally got a little bump. I mean, like, this is why there is so much struggling in the working class. Um, we need to have a livable wage. You know, wages not keeping up with prices at, at the current moment. Um, and we, we put aside whatever the causes may be, but the reality is people are hurting, whether it be at the gas station, at grocery stores. Um, you know, what do you think Congress can do to address lowering prices? They can take on the corporations and stop the profiteering. But again, that takes, you know, the political courage and willpower. And it takes you not being beholden to your corporate funded, you know, PACs and, and donor base. Um, and when you say take on the corporations, what do you mean by that? Well, we can definitely put limits. We can, like I said, we can end the, the profiteering. Um, and that's what's been happening right now. We need to, we need to put limits. We can address, we could address what's happening with the gas prices and put a limit on how much markup they can put on that. Um, you know, there is ways to address this. I mean, there's multiple ways without going into in great detail right now. Um, but yeah, we can be addressing this. Um, but it, again, it just takes that political willpower and courage. Well, in that same vein, what can Congress do to address the burgeoning housing crisis? Well, uh, w one of the things that I kind of spoke about earlier, we could be moving towards a Green New Deal um, and that would help us build affordable housing units. We have a real lack of that. Um, but on top of that, uh, we need to work with, uh, with states. And I know there's an argument right now in the state on who actually has the ability to do this, but on you know, capping rents um, and making sure that you know, it, it's affordable here. And then when we talk about own, owning a home, right? I mean, that, that has really hit our communities that are most at risk. Um, and I can take, for instance, the black community. Historically, that's how they have created their wealth. And right now, they have been impacted um, by decreasing home ownership more than any other community. And there is, again, a lack of affordable housing, and it's being bought up by outside interest. We need to address that. We need to limit the amount of investors that can come in and how much, how much a single homes they can actually buy and give precedent to you know, families. 
Um, we can also, you know, come up with some down payment assistance, right? Um, there's lots of things that we can do. We can be very creative. And the one thing I'm always saying that as I'm, you know, I'm not going to Congress just to sign on to any piece of legislation. I want to go and draft legislation and I want to involve you know, key stakeholders in our communities in these conversations, because, you know, none of us know everything. We need to involve the people that are out there on the front lines that are seeing this and seeing what's happening in the community to help draft the legislation to actually address what's ailing the community the most. And I think that's really been missing. You were critical earlier of the public lands bill, but some have been pointing to that as the means to help bring down housing prices. Do you disagree with that? And can you Absolutely. explain? Absolutely. It's going to cause white flight. It's building out in the suburbs, um, and it's going to increase the drive time. It's going to increase, I mean, you know, to do, even live there, you have to have a vehicle. So again, we're talking about the people that are most hit by our, by our housing crisis, our communities that are right now the most vulnerable. Um, it's going to create more emissions from gas, and the more emissions we have, it settles in, again, in our communities that are most at risk. It's going to settle down the valley, the east side, right? Um, it's not, it's, it's a further disinvestment from those hard hit communities. It's a disinvestment from the east side. The east side is lacking so many things. We don't, we, they are not, they, we do not invest in the east side like we do in Summerlin or we do in Henderson. It's largely been the home of disinvestment for a long time. It's time for us to invest back into these communities to build a, a sustainable housing. And again, we need to build up and not out. Um, that's very important. That has a huge impact on the climate crisis that we're facing right now. We cannot continue to, spr to do sprawl um, and, and to increase the emissions and increase the effects on our environment. You know, we're, we're also facing supply chain issues and building out housing right now is, is certainly not a cheap endeavor. Uh, do you think that's feasible in the short term to, to build up in Las Vegas and uh, you know, take that on? You know, if you, want, if you really wanna to get to what kind of Democrat I am, I am more like an FDR type Democrat. And he was facing a crisis <laughs> very similar as far as the economy worse, right? And the, his, the New Deal, that helped us get out of that crisis. And we, it was an investment in our infrastructure. It's why we have many of the parks we have. I mean, the, we're still benefiting from what, what happened during FDR. The more that we invest into our infrastructure and create those good paying union jobs, the more money that the average worker has in their pocket, the more our economy booms. You can only buy so many pairs of jeans as an ultra wealthy person, so many jets, so many houses, right? It stays stagnant, it increases inflation, right? The more that you put money out, the more that it's spent, the more inflation comes down and the more money earned through the average person's working pocket to spend on goods. And it creates a really robust economy. That's where we need to head. And then as so the Democrats, this should be a no brainer. This should be a no brainer. I mean, term limits were created because FDR was so popular. And when, they, when he was doing this, remember, they said all the big scary words, you know, when he said social security, oh, that's socialism. When he did public schools, oh, that's socialism. I mean, all these things, you know, this, this kickback, but these are things and fabrics of our society today we couldn't imagine not having. I'm glad you just brought up FDR and social security because uh, that was the next thing we we're gonna ask, you know, social security set to run out um, a little more than a decade, 2034. And would you take any action to, to shore up social security? Absolutely. So again, this is another program that we have not uh, adjusted according to um, you know inflation and according to pay rates. Um, it's not been adjusted as it should have been. There's no reason for it to have had to be to the point where it is now. We definitely do need to adjust the cap that you have for Social Security. Have people paying their fair share into Social Security. We this is this is a program that we cannot lose, and Democrats and Republicans alike agree on that. This is a subject that you do not touch, and it's political suicide for a reason because people depend on this. We don't have you know, companies offering the type of retirement plans that we used to have, right? We don't see that anymore in the workforce. People need to have social security. Um, otherwise, we're gonna have a tremendous problem. It isn't just gonna affect our, our, you know, our um, population that is older, it's gonna affect the families that end up having to take care of them. This is gonna create a crisis if we don't address it. I believe contributions stop somewhere around $147,000 in income. Do you mean that, that cap? Yes. Oh. Yep. It needs to be embraced. Let's move on to a topic that has received a lot of attention lately, abortion. Yeah. What would you, um, sorry, how would you protect abortion rights in Nevada in the case the Supreme Court uh, rules to overturn Roe v. Wade? You know, this is a very important topic. And regardless of where you stand on abortion, um, you should be very scared. 
because the foundation of why we have the right to make a choice on, uh, for our body and our autonomy is based on the right to privacy. That's the same basis as the right to being able to marry whoever you want, regardless of gender, or regardless of race. It's also why you have a right to make the decision whether or not you're gonna be on birth control. I mean, this is very scary. And I think we need to do whatever measures necessary, um, codify into law or pack the courts. We need to do something now to make sure that we are not allowing this to go through because again, it doesn't stop there. It will stop on many things that, reg again, regardless of how you feel about abortion, you have to make sure that this is protected. And, and, and I, will, I will say right now on the record that you know, I am 100% um, pro-choice, and I believe that we need to guard this. This is a woman's right, and uh, we should not be having to argue this again. Well, speaking of health care, you focus a lot on Medicare for All, and I've talked a lot about your experience with your daughter, unfortunately. How would you approach the Medicare for All? How do you think it should be funded? Well, I mean, there's the, the bill as it stands now, it's funded by the reduced cost in administrative overhead. We know that uh, typical insurance companies right now run about an 18% overhead rate. And uh, Medicare, as, we, as it is now, runs at a much lower, between three and 5%. Now, let's make sure we understand what Medicare for all is. It's not the Medicare you have now. It's an improved and expanded Medicare. So this Medicare would include dental, hearing, vision, it would include mental health, right? Long-term care, and the way that it's funded is the same way that a typical insurance company be funded. You know, when everybody's in and everybody's, you know, actually, you know, push, uh, uh, contributing to the insurance, right? Then that's how, you, that's how you cover everybody else. That's the way traditional insurance works as well. The problem with additional insurance is, is the profit motives in there. We're not only just paying for care, we're paying for those CEOs' bonuses, their outrageous pay rates. We're paying for the lobbyists that they send to Congress. We are paying for the individuals that are on the phone denying you care. That's what we're paying for. And then we pay more for health care than any other industrialized nation. And we have some of the worst health outcomes. And let's talk about Nevada. Nevada has some of the worst, worst health care outcomes in the nation. We have some of the least um, access and affordability to health care, and we have one of the highest uninsured rates in the nation. What's happening now is not working for Nevada. We need to move to a universal health care plan that will make sure everybody's in, nobody's out, and it's free at the point of service. Well, it, it's just never received widespread support, even the culinary union locally has opposed it. How do you feel about that? Actually, it has received high, high support. Over 70% of, of voters approve Medicare for all across party lines. It actually does have a lot of support. And when I'm talking about the individuals, the working class, the, the rank and file members, uh, Medicare for all is very popular. And imagine how wonderful it would be for unions. I mean, even for unions, I am very pro-union. If we don't have to go to the bargaining table and the first thing that's on the chopping block and that we have to fight for and give up everything else for, everything else that we want, better pay, longer vacations, better retirement plans. We have to forego all that because we have to fight to save our health care. This is, this, you know, Medicare for All is very pro-union, it's very pro-worker, and it's the humane thing to do. Again, even people who have insurance are struggling to get coverage for the things that they need. They are having to argue with insurance companies. They're having to pay high deductibles. Uh, they're have, and many of them, you know, cannot afford the medication that they need. And, and many people can't afford insulin. They are they're rationing their medications. We have to look at this in a holistic way that would really benefit. Not only is it a humane thing, but also financially it's the best way forward. Small businesses would benefit immensely from universal health care. I mean, they're not able to attract talent because they can't compete with the same kind of benefits packages, right? If we're not having to pay out an enormous amount of our income on health care, which is far more expensive, um, and instead we go to universal health care plan, then they're able to compete based on their company culture, based on their company, instead of their benefits packages, right? And unions the same way. Well, outside of winning 60 Senate seats, so what's the path forward for it? This is the people. You have to organize around the clock. We have to be talking not only to Democrats, but also Republicans, independents. This is not a party issue. This is a we the people issue. 
This is the American people. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. If you don't have health insurance, you are, you are, you are possibly going to suffer the same fate as anyone else next to you. And again, this is, a, this is very popular amongst the people, but it takes representatives and leaders who are gonna use their political power and have the political courage to continue you messaging on that and fighting for it around the clock. And that means you know, using every tool at your advantage uh, to organize both in DC and home locally. Um, and that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take the power of the people and we cannot give up just because it's hard, right? It was hard to go through the civil rights it was hard to get with the rights for women to vote. Anything that's worth fighting for takes, a, it takes time when you go against immense financial uh, you know, opposition and corporations, it's gonna take a fight and we have to have people in there ready to take that fight on. And you mentioned a little bit about uh, climate change and the Green New Deal, but what are your priorities when it comes to that? To the Green New Deal? Uh, the climate change. Yeah. Well, like, well, like I said, we need, definitely need to have a Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. We need to be working to that. We need to once and for all end our addiction to fossil fuel and work towards 100% renewable energy, which means we need to invest in research and making sure that we're developing. And why not become the leaders in producing green new energy? I mean, that would give us lots of good paying jobs. We could be exporters of green new energy. We could bring that industry here to Nevada. We are set up and primed to be a leader in, in green technology. Um, so we definitely need to be working towards that. We need to be 100% on board. We need to, you know, this, is, this solves a lot of our problems, both um, by addressing our climate you know, uh, crisis, we're also addressing the need for better paying union jobs. We're addressing our need for better housing. We're addressing the need to lower the cost of utilities by retrofitting these housing. Um, making sure that we are built, rebuilding our infrastructure, which is so badly needed. And, you know, uh, there's many gr uh, green bills out here that are addressing also prioritizing our communities uh, of color. So we need to be making sure that we are fighting and going towards that. And I was reading, um, you know, just recently that many of the scientists are saying we have three years. We have to address this with the urgency the crisis demands. And like I said, I mean, I was just reading today that you know, people, Holmes and Henderson might have, you know, uh, uh, problems getting water here soon because the water level is getting so low in Lake Mead. There is an urgency and a crisis. We shouldn't be talking about expanding Las Vegas by the size of St. Louis right now. We have a crisis. I mean, we are literally running out of water and running out of time. We have to start addressing this in substantial ways. This is not a time to talk about incrementalism. We have to be we have to be bold and fighting for this in a bold manner. In regards to renewable energy, are you do you agree with nuclear? Um, I agree that we need to be working towards 100 percent renewable and clean energy, which does not include nuclear. Okay. But we have to be able we have to start investing in that technology and, and, and we have to get off fossil fuels. So we have to work our way towards that. And uh, there, there, we cannot use that as an excuse to not keep going forward for green energy and being bold on this. And we certainly don't use it as an excuse to start expanding Las Vegas and signing on to the SNCCA or the Clark County Lands deal. What would you do differently on the issues um, than Dina Titus? Well, I think what we're, you know, what we're talking about is really not, um, you know, who's more progressive or not. It's really about how we fight and the, the level of energy that goes into this. This is not a time to be complacent. Um, we have to be using, again, we're not just going to Congress to sign on to any piece of legislation. That's the bare minimum. Being a co-sponsor is the bare minimum step. We have to be actively organizing. We have to be act actively engaging our constituents and, and key stakeholders in these communities and writing legislation you know, I know what it's like to fight. I know what it's like to get up and not know where my next meal is going to come from. I know what it's like to get up and not have a home for my children. I know what it's like to wake up every day and have to pull myself out of bed because I'm suffering from grief. I know how to fight. That's what I plan to take to Congress. I plan to take that fight to Congress. Mm -hmm. I know how to do that. And I know how to, you know, work around the clock for these issues. That drive is in me. Again, we need to have people in office who understand the struggle, who understand what's at stake and have lived it, because then it becomes, you understand the emergency of it. 
the urgency of acting, of na the urgency of now, right? And that's what I think is missing. Yeah, speaking of Congress, do you believe a Republican-led Congress would take any action on climate change? I think that if we're organizing nonstop, that yes, we can. They also have to answer to their constituency. Um, I'm not one that believes because we have a Republican-led House or uh, Senate that that's an excuse to stop the work. Right. There is lots of work to be done. A bill, it takes a long time for a bill to get to the point where it can be put, you know, uh, presented on the House floor, but it even takes more work to get it to pass. So we have to be working cons constantly around the clock. I mean, this is this is not a time to be complacent. It's a time to actually go and to, to organize and, and to make sure that we're in this fight 100 percent. So, you know, recently we've seen a spike in, in homicides. Uh, I think there was just new data about a spike in gun related deaths in 2021. Um, what would you do to address rising crime, rising gun violence? Uh, well, those are two different, well, there's two different avenues there. Um, you know, when people feel desperation, when they feel that they don't have anything to live, to live for or going for them, a lot of times that has direct implications on the, the rise in crime rates. Um, we've seen a rise during COVID because people felt despair. Right. People don't feel that there's a future when you have a future, when you are having a good paying job, when you're able to buy a home, you're able to go on vacation and provide for your family. You're less likely to go out and commit crime. Right. So we need to address the, the core reason underlying why we have so much despair and crime. Um, we also need to make sure that um, we're having um, criminal justice reform, that we're also addressing the disparities between the different communities. When we're talking about crime, I can't talk about crime without addressing that, right? We still have people sitting in jail for nonviolent drug offenses for cannabis, and yet we have people that are profiting off of it. We need to make sure that we're addressing this in a really holistic way and make sure that we have a criminal system that is fair, and we need to make sure that it, we are demilitarizing it and that we have people in place also to help with calls for people that are having you know, mental health issues, that are having crisis in their families. Not everything has to be handled with force and with, with jail, right? If we had more social workers and more people on our police force helping to augment uh, the work that our police officers do, then we could have a more just and, uh, and, and actually a, a police force that's actually um, having a better outcome. So I think there's lots of different steps that we can do to address this. Does making that change, do you think that that calls for changing how we fund the police, defunding the police? I think that we can, you know, we can actually, you know, use some of the funds that we have for uh, militarizing our police to actually you know, hire more social workers, hire people that understand crisis and actually can come out. I mean, we have seen too many deaths from people who are suffering a mental breakdown or a mental health crisis. Um, that could have possibly been avoided by having someone there that's trained to do that. Our officers are not trained to go out and handle uh, mental health crises, right? And they shouldn't have to do that. Um, they're there, they're there to, to protect us against other forms of violence and things of that sort. So I feel like, you know, we need to take a common sense approach to how we are using our police force and make sure we're, we're giving them the best tools possible for the best outcomes, right? And the fair outcomes. Um, I'm sure everybody on this panel would agree that we don't want to see people, you know, being shot down um, because they are having a mental health crisis. And I don't want to see officers having to go through that either, right? It's not good for anyone involved. Um, so I think there's a real common sense way of approaching that. That's humane. I think we'll end on a very Nevada question, and that is about Yucca Mountain. What do you think should be done about Yucca Mountain and nuclear waste storage? I think there's a lot of concerns around Yucca Mountain, especially when we talk about the transport of nuclear waste. Um, we definitely uh, need to avoid that. I don't think we're set for that to be a um, uh, set for that to be successful at this point. Um, and so, at the, you know, I definitely am not in agreement with storing nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And to viewers, thank you also for joining us for this on the record interview with Amy Valilla. Stay tuned for more candidate interviews between now and the primary election on June 14th.